Hi, this is Peter Godinas, and welcome to the first ever the Xerox Technology Hour. And this is our first show, and we're really excited to be here. And before I begin, I want to introduce you to something that's very significant and significant to me. Uh, today's date is August 3rd, 2010, and this is the wonderful lady, Cindy Bridges Moss, who hired me in August 3rd, 1981. So that would make me 29, I believe. But Cindy, welcome. Thank you so much. It's been a hectic day, but it's great to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Peter. It was a pleasure to hire you. I can't believe we're sitting here today after 29 years. It's such an appropriate day to be together. And uh, it's, it, it has been a fabulous ride at Xerox for both of us. And I think that's what we're going to spend our time doing today is talking a little bit about our lives with Xerox, about Xerox as a company, and uh, where it's going. It's excellent. And I think it's appropriate to some on TV that, my gosh, you have not changed in years. So I think that's appropriate for television. But I think this is very significant. I think this is the first ever uh, TV show on the Internet that is, being that is being celebrated by Xerox Corporation. And especially in smaller communities like Ventura, Santa Barbara County. And we'll even throw San Luis Obispo into the equation there. So we're hoping to entertain you, educate you, and inspire you and the shows to come. And we're gonna have several interesting people, probably not as, as interesting, as good looking as Cindy, but you know, we're an equal opportunity lender. So it'll be a diversity of different people. So one of the things I wanted to begin is so significant, 29 years, Cindy, it just feels like last month. And we look back and we had a chance to be at lunch and kind of catch up. It's time has gone by quick. It has, it has gone by very, very quickly. And I can't believe that we're back together again because Peter was one of the best people I ever worked with at Xerox. Um, our paths have crossed again most recently in talking about doing this show and working together in a professional manner for my organization to work with Xerox Corporation. It's just been an amazing 29 years and a great full circle back. No, and that's wonderful. And one of our goals, especially in smaller communities, the fact that Xerox definitely does need to be an integral part of the community, and it's shows like this that will promote that. And what we have here, uh, Cindy, I really want to put some nostalgia to this particular statement. Uh, so we have several older commercials, and some do, that hopefully some of you will bring back some nostalgia. Maybe some of you were too young to remember, but what the heck. So the first one we're going to actually show is the Xerox story, and it's like the transformation. Uh, you'll get a chance to see the very first Xerox copy, the inventor, and a little clips of the first commercials that were ever played on television. So hit it, Maestro.
Now that just brings back memories. And some of the things that you saw was the very first Xerox original that was printed out by Chester Carlson, who, sh who actually uh, performed the first one in Astoria. And I forget what state it was. Do you remember? I don't remember. I would have failed that test. Yeah. I would have put all the above. I don't think that was on our new hire test at Xerox. <laughs> Well, I remember it, Cindy, because you know what was happening? They put it, you remember the demonstration package that they used to give all the sales rep? Well, they put that one in the copy package. And the first thing I think was, this looks like terrible copy quality. And I would tend to forget to tell the customer that this is the very first uh, you know, copy ever made in the history of the world. And if you forgot that, it kind of lost the effectiveness of it. Right. And then Chester Carlton, did you know much about him? I've seen pictures of him. You're way too young to actually have met him, but do you remember any of the stories about Chester? I don't remember stories, but I remember my own experience with Chester because when we first got hired by Xerox, we had to remember a lot of Xerox facts, like who made the first Xerox um, copy and who took, it, who took that copy and made a company around it. And so Chester Carlson and, and uh, all the rest of the people that followed his leadership we had a big test on it, so I remember that aspect of it. Well, speaking of tests, I'm sure you remember the nine steps of the xerography process, because you had the expectation of me that uh, I would know that. Do you at least remember the first one? I, I don't remember the first one. either. It's all the above. <laughs> so I remember that, and again, there were several of the commercials. I mean, Xerox is an American icon that is still impacting the world today where a lot of uh, companies are being bought out and controlled by companies outside the United States. Uh, Xerox basically is a company that is actually branching out in a global way. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any examples of something maybe you can quote in that? Well, ACS, the, the uh, purchase of ACS, which is a global company, and it's uh, changing the, the way Xerox brings itself to market and making it more than what we traditionally know as a copier company and going from a copier company to a printing company to a software company. So it's really morphing itself into a lot of different industries instead of the traditional industry that we all started with. No, definitely. And we call it Xerox Technology Show. And obviously Xerox made its name in copiers, but they're into every form of actual um, technology. And in fact, I hope we get some pictures, but uh, Stevie Wonder, if you remember the Kurzweil machine, mm -hmm, yes. it was a device that actually helped the blind be able to read and communicate. And so I think that's far from being a copier. Mm -hmm. And even what you look like now. But we even have another commercial. My favorite icon of all time, besides you, Cindy, of course, is the Xerox monk. If you're out there and you remember that, raise your hand. How many people remember the name of the actor? Do you remember? I, you know, my memory is, I'm too old to remember <laughs> much, Peter. Well, so why don't I remember all this stuff? Jack Eagle played the Xerox monk. And does everybody know what the big thing was? It was the mantra, it's a miracle. And you know, we haven't had an icon or a face like that in a long time. No, but I remember him distinctly. We used to have to go to some of these conventions and we showed Xerox equipment along with our competitors showed Xerox equipment and the monk was roaming around all over the place. I think his favorite part of those conventions was working with the women. Frankly, he was um, quite a flirt, but um, quite an icon with Xerox. So I have several fun pictures um, in my scrapbook. Now we're going to get those in a, and put those up as well. And he, that was his claim to fame. I mean, the amount of money I'm sure Xerox paid for him just to wear a, what do you call it, maybe a gunny sack, if you want to call it that. Yeah, gunny sack and a rope. That was it. And he'd show up to shows. And the only thing I saw him afterwards was a Flushman's butter commercial, and that was it. And then, you know, unfortunately, he passed away, I want to say, in like the 2004, 2005 time frame. So I know he's watching this from above, because it's a miracle. <laughs> so I have another commercial that you can play here. It was a football commercial that was played, I'm sure when football was really a nostalgic thing, and Xerox captured it, and it was based on mapping. Xerox 
Cox is applying its technology to all phases of communication. Whether it be in business, government, education, medicine, or even landing men on the moon. At Xerox, we're working to find new ways of getting information to people who need it. And most important, when they need it. Wow, you know, when I look back at that commercial, it brings me back to the 70s. You can tell a little bit of the graininess. The coach is screaming, that hasn't changed at all. But the concept of carrying a document around while you're writing a pattern yeah. and watching a, a uh, watch, looking at a piece of paper to know where you're gonna throw it to was a little overboard. So for that, hope you're having fun so far, but we're gonna take a station break. Now, stay on the channel and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Peter Godinus from KDTV.com. I'm here to announce a new show that we're all excited about here called Meet the Boss. Now this is about all your friends and neighbors who own businesses and being able to support them in their causes and helping them stay healthy. So save this program in your favorites, make sure you spread it out to your friends, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all here in Ventura County. Hi, welcome back, and we're here with my special diva friend, Cindy Bridges Moss, who hired me 29 years ago, and it just feels like two months ago, and uh, we're just reminiscing about the impact Xerox has had on this world, and especially the impact that it's going to have now, today, and in the future of things. And so uh, I want to put some commercials forward. Uh, one of my favorites really launched Xerox into just not putting black marks on paper, but a thing called print on demand, which means, hey, print it when you want it, don't store it away. So I think this commercial will really give you the idea. What do you think? I think so. You know, let's watch Go it. Go for it. Against you. Why money? A publisher must commit thousands of dollars for an initial... Uh, that's not exactly true. With on-demand publishing technology, everything's digitized. People can even print one book at a time and forget warehousing. So now everyone here can get published. Yeah. All right. Did that get the point across? You know, it's the publisher thing I think was amazing, Cindy, that to be a publisher, you really don't need a you know, a big production to be able to produce thousands and then throw 80% of them away. Correct. That's a lot of trees. That's real trees. And I know one of the things you did train me on is the fact that print on demand, why create 5,000 when you're going to throw 80% of them away? Right. Because the information has changed. And so I thought that was a commercial that really applies today. Uh, I was one of these believers, City. Were you ever a believer in the... Uh, paperless environment? Absolutely. In fact, I work with a lot of clients today that believe paper is going completely away. We hear a lot about scanning your documents and your receipts and that pretty soon we will have a paperless office. But I heard, I think I heard those words about the day you were hired. Oh man, that was some And I'm times. still hearing them today, so I have a lot of faith that a lot of paper is going to be around for a while. I think so. I think so. And I think that what's changed it is, do you want to answer it's a two-letter word, starts with I, it's internet. <laughs> the internet's changed that, where maybe people aren't printing as much, but the number of times somebody clicks a button has definitely changed. And I'll tell you, that was one of my first commercials I realized that Xerox was just not going to be a black mark on paper. And uh, obviously, you and I talked about how much fun it was in the 1981 time frame, although it was a really kind of a fun culture, if I remember right. You know, so. Um, just this humorous commercial that I want to play next kind of gives you the fact that Xerox is a funny company. You know, uh, Jackie uh, Eagle was funny on the, uh, on the commercials and kind of a mean guy at, uh, at uh, trade shows. But uh, this kind of gives you an idea of the humor that Xerox had. So again, play it again, Maestro. Color. So, she's going to flip. No. This is Xerox work center. Prince Color for pennies a page. Color's good. Presentation's good. I'm shocked. Glad you like it, sir. 
You are shocked? Really? Because we're shocked. Shocked you even get it, pal. <laughs> Dave, what are you doing here? Came and fixed the mute button. Bye-bye bonus. Now, Sydney, how many times have you ever done that where you spoke at a turn and the person you didn't really want to, to uh, hear it actually did and what you dealt with it? So I really love that mute commercial, but that's never happened to you, Cindy. Oh, never, never. Never was I ever on one of these mics and I said something <laughs> wrong and it was blasted throughout the whole organization. And I think we've had a few politicians that have made that mistake recently. I think so. I mean, the old saying that what stays in Vegas is not stays in Vegas, it ends up on YouTube, <laughs> LinkedIn, Facebook, and all the above. So it is definitely a different world. Now, Cindy, one of the things I want to ask you about, and I know you remember this part of it, was... Xerox really manage diversity. And yes. what I mean by that is different categories, but it was, I met you at a time where it was a male dominated culture. And you were this bright, talented person right from UCLA, all, all happy and excited to go change the world. And then you hit this industry that probably took you by surprise. So what's it feel like to be an empowered professional businesswoman? Can you rate some of the pains and some of the joys you had during that time frame? Well, I can tell you that I was very fortunate to be hired during the late 70s and have a career that soared at Xerox in the 80s. Um, women, at, at right before, probably the hour before I was hired, were known as secretaries, flight attendants, teachers. Those were the professions that most women went into. Um, and, and then all of a sudden I graduated from UCLA and there were two high-tech companies mm -hmm. to interview with, only two. IBM and Xerox. You might consider a few others. There were 3M or Pitney Bowes, but the two big ones. I interviewed with both of them, got hired by both of them, or got, got an offer by both of them, and I went to the most fun company to work for, and that was Xerox. I loved the people, and I saw a career path that was endless to me, and it was. Um, every year I enjoyed a new job with more challenge and more responsibility. Um, Xerox was very, very friendly to minorities and women. And as a result, Xerox launched a lot of careers that have taken people to the highest places in, in um, corporate business. CEO, many CEOs today, um, jobs were started at Xerox Corporation. Mm. So, well, and unfortunately, like you mentioned Carla Fiora okay. yes. and uh, Ann Mulcahy and the uh -huh. present leader, uh, mm -hmm. Ursula Burns mm -hmm. from Xerox. Mm -hmm. So to borrow from an old-time commercial, because my age is showing me, is you've come a long yeah. way, baby. I'm sure my producer remembers that one because I think he produced it. Even but Barry ran at AARP. He runs AARP today. That's true. And I Google him Xerox and person. that's that comes up. You type his name, none of the Xerox stuff. Not that comes I up. know anything about AARP. No, isn't all. that a racing car thing or is that a <laughs> 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 No, but the diversity, I thought that's what made Xerox such a great company. And I know it was very painful for the various uh, diversities to actually exist in that. And uh, I'm one of these people, I've said on camera before, I value the empowered professional business women. Mm -hmm. I'm one of these guys that think, you know, women, we, uh, that women are the more powerful gender. And as guys, we better start learning how to behave or we're in some big trouble. But Xerox actually started that. And when you look at the population of uh, females, uh, a majority of them are more successful than males. And, uh, you could state that, but I can't. Well, what right? I'm amazed at today, and I'm working with Xerox as, as we speak as a consultant, how many women are in vice president, uh, presidential positions all the way from a sales rep sometimes all the way through to the CEO that's a woman. And that, to me, is amazing after the years I've spent away from Xerox, which has been 20, and in my consulting business. It's been an amazing transformation. It really has been. And um, I transitioned and took a little boot camp training after 2001. But I remember meeting Ann Mulcahy for the first time at uh, LAX uh, a hotel there. And actually had her sign my Bible and asked her how she was doing. She said, rather tired, I miss my family. And then I realized that this is one lady who basically, I think, saves her ox. And probably there are people out there mm -hmm. who might disagree, but she took a flair and an attractiveness, I don't mind throwing that in there, bright that basically held this company together for all those years. And so it's always good seeing her speak at universities and places like that. So mm -hmm. it's something definitely... I remember from my Xerox experience, it hopefully carries on in the year 2010 and beyond because I saw it at a very early age in my career in terms of the diversity portion of it. So talk about the people. I mean, one of the things you told me, Xerox has a lot of good training. Yeah. 
but when people say that, I say, yeah, they have a lot of good training, but we agreed that there was something else. Well, we hired great people. And we, I think we hired people that we liked and that were fun to be around with. And didn't, they, they, it did, didn't just matter what skills they brought to the table, but would we like to be with them at 7 o'clock in the morning when we all got to work? And would we still want to be with them at 7 o'clock at night when we were role playing and um, practicing our selling skills? And would we want to do anything after 7 with them? Meaning like a lot of us worked out together. We started the Xerox Relay team. We used to spend weekends together running, running relays all over <laughs> Southern California. And so we created quite a friendship. Plus Xerox had, has, to this day, an event called President's Club. And top performers would go away for two or three uh, days, extend up to two or three weeks, um, to places like Hawaii and Italy and all over the globe. And we became such good friends that our friendships have lasted like a hours long time. to this minute. A long and time. a lot of us see each other on Facebook and LinkedIn and end up meeting and, and reuniting and we have the warmest of feelings for each other. So it was the people that really made the difference. The people. And you know, we'll talk more about the social media towards a, a later segment. But you know, just for fun of it, I, I'm, I remember Romper Room and they used to have that thing and I see, I see Earl, I see Lexi, and I used to sit in front of the table and say, say Peter, say Peter. Well, let's practice this. How many people do we keep in contact? And I'll start, Dave Sakai. Dan Durbeck, who else did we talk about today? Glenn Carter. Glenn uh, Carter. Natalie Fleet. Natalie Fleet. Uh, who else do I, uh, did you say? I said um, Dan Durbeck. We yeah. said, you know, uh, Paul, Paul Orfila. Uh, Jolie were, Tolner. Jolie Tolner. Le Kathy Lenahan. Uh, Mike Barron. I know uh, we're forgetting to say Seth Brandis. Oh, <laughs> Seth I'm glad. Seth Brandis. I know he would have, <laughs> I know I would have got a message. You already said Keith Gunther, didn't Keith you? Keith Gunther, I yeah, did. Yes. Um, Liz Britt is somebody, some of the, the women. Yeah, Ron Papil. Ron Papil. Not the one that sells the and hair products. And the person that, that hired me, Jack Blumen. Jack Blumen. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, yeah. so that's always a good thing. So it just kind of shows you how the people, you stay with them, and hopefully the relationships keep on building from that. And so um, the people that make the difference, mm -hmm. and again, that's what I hope happens more in this community, the connection of people. And like you said, the Internet helps us stay in contact. And you know, Cindy, I'm afraid that maybe that was a bad exercise because someone's going to call up and say, well, you know what? You forgot you about me. forgot me. I think of H.T. Oh, uh, Harold Turner. <laughs> and he married the famous Rachel. I used to call her Rachel Ward for the heck, but it's Rachel Turner. Yeah. Uh, Jones, yeah. right? Yes, that's right. You know, John Jagger, he's my manager now. I used yeah. to work for him. So things change, you mm -hmm. know. So it's amazing how important it is to stick together in this economy, in this culture, or you cannot do it by yourself. You gotta have your close friends, and they don't even need to be in the same city, but you gotta keep in communication with that. So, just to take a break from me here, we're gonna go to a station break, so come on back. Hi, this is Peter Godinus from KDTV.com. I'm here to announce a new show that we're all excited about here called Meet the Boss. Now this is about all your friends and neighbors who own businesses and being able to support them in their causes and helping them stay healthy. So save this program in your favorites, make sure you spread it out to your friends, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all here in Ventura County. Hi! Oh, you came back! Thank you! That was very nice of you. So we're back here again with my lovely friend, Cindy Bridges Moss. And we were talking about a lot of things, who we know, but I think we really should talk a little bit about the leadership because obviously people follow good leaders. And uh, I'm sure you've had your uh, run of really good ones and really bad ones. <laughs> so, you know, I want to play a, uh, a clip, Joe Wilson, uh, which is in black and white, and listen to the message because quite frankly, uh, it came true. So his vision actually is something that you're looking at right now that was a vision that he had. So welcome Joe Wilson. So let's play that tape. Imagination and the use of creativity and, and the use of uh, brains to think of new ideas. We don't want to do things the same old way. We suspect the same old way. Therefore, if, as you come here, I hope you come with an attitude that change will be a way of life for you. You will not be doing things tomorrow the way you're doing them today. And if you do, we will feel that some way or other the momentum that 
has taken years and years to build up is perhaps slowing down, and I assure you, we'll bend every effort we know how to keep it from slowing down. Therefore, we're, see we're seeking people who are willing to accept risk, who are willing to try new ideas, who have new ideas of their own, who are not afraid to change what they are doing from one day to the next or one year to the next, who welcome new challenges, who welcome new people, who welcome new positions. And if you're that sort of person, you'll be very welcome here at Xerox. All right, pretty impressive, huh? I mean, black and white, and brings back a little nostalgia. Look like the typical Rochester kind of person with the thick glasses and things like that. And obviously things are changed because Ursula Burns is definitely a different personality than, than he is. But who are some of your favorite leaders of Xerox? Probably some of the local ones. You want to talk well, to them about some, that? I had some local leaders that taught me a lot through my mistakes. And I can remember one local leader was Jack Finnell, actually. He was my vice president and I was working for him and one day he decided to say let's go make some sales calls and when you're a salesperson you're supposed to have a day full of sales calls already planned which supposed I had, to hey, go ahead. I had no sales calls planned <laughs> but I winged it and pretended like I did have sales calls planned so the very first place I took him was NBC Studios which was one of my accounts and we had just had a slew of pieces of equipment delivered and um, things weren't going so well with the delivery and Jack Fennell said, I, you know, Cindy, I don't think I should be here during this di fiasco that's occurring between NBC and Xerox right now, so why don't you take me somewhere else? <laughs> so we went to Warner Records, to another um, or organization I worked with, and we met with Vince, my decision maker. And Vince said, you know, Cindy, I keep everything, all my pieces of equipment on month to month just to keep Xerox on their toes. And uh, Jack looked at me like, you have an account that's going to canceled this, this this big, it was the second largest account in um, the Woodland Hills area and Southern California area, and he said, you're letting them stay on month to month? And I embarrassingly said, that's Vince's decision, which is really my job to keep that from happening. So we kept going through accounts that I had not planned my day, and I realized at the end of the day that I never want an unplanned day, because you never know who's going to be traveling with you in the field or you demonstrating your skills the wrong way, too. So. Thanks to Jack, I've been a big planner ever since, and he's a great leader, and I still am in contact. He's another one of the people that I stay in contact with. Um, we see each other probably once every two months, have dinner, and I thank him for things that he trained me you on. Know. Well, we mentioned Jack Bloom, and he was the opposite. His big thing was wing it. So, you know, one of the stories I know you could tell, I could tell, but I know you tell it better, but there's a person by the name of Paul Orfila. If you don't know who Paul Orfila is, he is the founder of Kinko's. And I know Cindy went to UCLA, and I know she was friends, or your friends at UCLA and at Xerox, with a lady named Natalie Fleet. Why don't you take it from there? <laughs> well, I remember the day Paul walked in, Paul Orfila walked into Xerox and said, I want to start a copy, um, copy business, and I want to rent a copier. Well, in those days, we didn't believe anybody could walk out of, he was right out of college like I was, only he was from the other college, USC, and asked, asked me if he could rent a copier and I go, well, what's your credit rating? Because usually people would rent these giant copiers that cost $100,000, $200,000. They'd say they were renting them. They'd run a lot of copies and start a coffee shop and make a lot of money. And then one day we'd go see what's going on with our copier because we hadn't received payment. And the copier would be there in an empty office and there would be nobody there and the door would be open and we'd have to go gather that used copier up that we had to sell now used and re we'd have to refurbish it and it cost a lot of money and we made nothing on it. <laughs> so we looked at Paul Orfila and said, you know, we really have to check you out inside and out. Well, we checked him out and decided to take a risk on Paul Orfila. And we got to know Paul pretty well. He became part of our team. He opened one shop, two shops. He used to run with us during the Xerox relays, he, um, in working with our organization, met a lovely woman, Natalie Fleet, who was my good friend. And I'd like to say that Paul and Natalie have been happily married for, geez, over 25 years now. I believe that. Um, we've shared some really heartfelt experiences together, Natalie and I have. And um, I've kept in touch with them even as recently as a couple of years ago. We ran into each other at Park City. She's there right up here in Santa Barbara. So. The Kinko story doesn't need to be told by me. Everybody knows the success of, Xerox, of, of Kinko's, but it started at Xerox. Well, you tell it better than anybody I know. 
And the thing about Natalie, talking about empowered professional businesswomen, we went cold calling together and talk about just your, I'll say, courageous females. In cold calling, she would walk right past the receptionist, act like she'd own the place. And here I am following, just shaking in my boots, this kid from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I realized this is the most powerful creature I think I've ever seen in my whole life. And then she ended up marrying Paul Orfila. And you, like you said, they're living happily ever after here in the Tri-Counties. That's right. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing, the fact that uh, there are Paul Orfila's now existing in this world that proof that Xerox can actually help and make a risk in you, take investment in you, and make you big. Even if you're from USC. No, that's, you know, it's funny, from USC, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the sadness of it all is I'm from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, you know, the Mustangs, and a football team, if they lose, you know, <sighs> big deal. People from UCLA, USC, their team loses. They're all depressed for weeks. And I go, you don't even play football. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but I got to tell you, Paul and his wife Natalie went up to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Somehow they knew he uh, uh, was a fan or passion for, for learning disorder. So Paul goes up, there's smart people from Cal Poly, show him a particular major on, on children, and uh, Paul offers them $30 million in donations. And guess what, we'll throw this in, Paul, we'll name the business department after you. Wait a minute, you're a stinking USC graduate, and you're in <laughs> my business department, the Paul Orfala School of Business. <laughs> It kind of shows you that when you have money, you can get a name building after you. So uh, Cindy Bridges building <laughs> of education, educating empowered professional business women. So such a history. He was somebody that we took a history on and somebody named Joel Hackett. Mm -hmm. Your partner was involved in that one. Mm -hmm. What Which was his name? Oh, Andy Props. Andy Props with the, with the Kinko's deal. Yeah. yeah. Was he involved yeah. in it? He was involved in, well, first Paul, you know, Paul became, Kinko's became a huge organization and then they started buying not one and two and three machines but 20 machines 50 machines a thousand machines 4,000 machines across the country so we had my <laughs> one of my partners Andy Props <laughs> negotiated deals eventually with uh, Kinko's and Kinko's ended up employing a lot of Xerox people Very much a lot so. of our Dan people when they Dan Fredrickson Glenn Carter um, who worked with me Dan Fredrickson was our controller at yep. Xerox when Peter and I worked together and and when those people decided to retire from Xerox, he really didn't retire. They just went to another type of Xerox, which was Kinko's. Same business. No, it keeps on growing and growing and growing. And um, I think it's wonderful. And again, who are they going to be the Paul Orphalas of the future, all because of Xerox's help? And I have a prediction a lot of them are going to come from the Tri-Counties. In fact, I would probably get beat up if I didn't mention Harry Waller, oh, okay. who, if anybody has ever read uh, Paul's book called Copy This, I mean, there's a whole chapter dedicated to Harry Waller, and he was a technician. He used to drive around Isla Vista. It looked like he was a narc, as they called it. <laughs> and uh, he saw the first, uh, you know, credit rejection <laughs> from Paul Orvilla. <laughs> and then Joel Hackett would actually write the contract. His mom, his mom, excuse me, oh my gosh. His wife actually was an English teacher, wrote up the contract, mm -hmm. and that was the first legal contract that Xerox wrote with a major organization. So the tradition continues with Xerox. And I don't know how much time on, but I would love to play the uh, David T. Kerr. It's gotta be one of my favorite leaders, uh, besides Ant, <laughs> the male leaders, I'll put it, that really helped shape Xerox. Uh, he went on, it was pursued by George W. George w. Bush, no, George, George Bush, Senior. the father. Senior. The father as the Secretary of Education. So I wanna play this clip because it was really an honor uh, to see David in this commercial. The chairman and CEO of a company, because back then there was a certain grandeur to the role. David would help and talk with anyone. David doesn't put on airs. He's a humble man, but he's also a fearless man. He had to be to run a corporation and take on a great challenge like America's public schools. David Burns has never run from a fight. As a matter of fact, he started one or two, uh, all for the good of the community and the good of his company. When he took Xerox from a bad place to winning the Malcolm Baldrige Award for quality, that helped David to understand the value of education. 
opportunity in Japan, David had the foresight to see how crucial education would be for America's future in the global economy. He left corporate America to go into public service to go serve. His friends told him not to do it. Uh, this was 1991. Here he was, the CEO of Xerox, and he was at the peak of his leadership in education. I called him personally more than once, and I'm not afraid to say I leaned on him pretty hard. I said, your country needs you. He dealt with issues that went beyond the classroom. Hunger. Learning in terrible facilities. I went to a, uh, an old, segregated, dilapidated, overcrowded, double-sessioned high school. I used a plain geometry book in 1951 that had been used by a white student in 1935. They were not giving young white people the opportunities that they needed to make the state a successful entity. Just dumb. In some areas, up to 50% of our public high school students are dropping out. We have to level the playing field for all students. David didn't believe in just throwing money or technology at a problem. He made himself personally accountable for getting results. He didn't just dream about it. He made phone calls. He made office visits. He made speeches. He used the resources of his office and his place in corporate America to exert influence. David set an example by committing to social progress and the public sector. I'd like to see the business community support this partnership. We can accomplish so much together. David understood that. When I think of David Kern, certain words come to mind. Leader. Yeah. He has a high sense of purpose. Focused, visionary. He just had a lot of fun to be around. He's, he's a great guy. Dude, I'm sorry I couldn't personally be at the dinner tonight. Yeah, I hope you're well. You deserve this honor. And I'm with you, my friend, is always in spirit. David, I'm very proud to call you my friend. Man, he is, David has always been an a inspiration to me. And just like John F. Kennedy, no matter what side of the fence you were on politically, you just had to love John F. Kennedy. And David Kearns was the same thing. Very warm, uh, very approachable gentleman. Uh, just very charismatic in front of, of the audience. And uh, I sure missed him. I know Xerox was a big thing. But he went on to bigger and better things. And so with that, we're going to take a station break. So thanks for hanging in here. Hi, this is Peter Godinas from KDTV.com. I'm here to announce a new show that we're all excited about here called Meet the Boss. Now this is about all your friends and neighbors who own businesses and being able to support them in their causes and helping them stay healthy. So save this program in your favorites, make sure you spread it out to your friends, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all here in Ventura County. Hi, welcome back to the Xerox Technology Hour. We're having a blast. If you just join us, I have my mentor, my heroine, Cindy Bridges Omas with me. We're thinking about the past. We're talking about the people. We're talking about leadership. And hey, you know, Ward Wallace is going in the year 2010. And you know, what I want to do since uh, one of the things they do as a company, Xerox, is I live by this rule, somebody's got to sell something, right, Cindy? Mm -hmm. If nothing gets sold, we're all in a bit big trouble. But we're more of a believer in buying, uh, like promoting buying behavior, people buying at their own timing. But this is one of my favorite commercials that kind of shows you that once Xerox lost the patent for xerography, every company outside the United States just went crazy. And I think this commercial really captured it. So Maestro, give it a, give it a little ringy dingy there. I've been introducing small copiers with a very interesting claim. It's just as good as a Xerox. It's just as good as a Xerox. 
Then one day, and this compact copier is very versatile. Mm -hmm. It even copies on your own letterhead. Uh -huh. It's inexpensive, but best of all... I know, it's just as good as a Xerox. Uh, well, um, it is a Xerox. The Xerox 2600, the compact copier that really is just as good as a Xerox. Now, Cindy, that to me is like everybody just calls it a Xerox. You know, how many times do people have used the, the term Xerox as a, as a generic type of thing? Right. And uh, again, these, these gentlemen, notice there were no women in this commercial. <laughs> it's a while back. I mean, I'm the darkest person in this commercial, so this is always a, something a little different, but they're salespeople just schlepping around and trying to sell their wares. And uh, even Andy Props, your business partner, was talking about how he used to go and take a unit. He'd pay somebody who was on the street a dollar to help him carry it to the building. Mm -hmm. And he would take it from building to building and just push the elevator button. He'd walk in with the copier and he'd start doing demos. And, um, and in Andy Props' day, we were replacing carbon paper and mimeograph. So I don't know how many people are watching that remember those two ways of making copies, but... The first days of Xerox, my partner Andy, he was rolling some brand new technology around that people had never heard of or seen, and he had to show them how a copy could be made and could be made without smearing and without wet process. So it was quite a change for. Well, I don't think too many people know how much a copier during those days weighed, but imagine uh -huh. taking a washing machine and, and walking around a professional building. In a business suit, and yes. on case in your days it was a suit with the right. white shirt right. and the, we look, the we red had to look bow like men. and white, and white uh, like the high heels. That's one thing the guys couldn't do. But can you imagine carrying the washing machine around right. to 15 different floors? I mean, selling has definitely changed a lot, and uh, I just thought about how different it is just in terms of selling. Mm -hmm. So Xerox, we're still selling what they call copiers, but they're not copiers anymore. Right. I mean, they do so much more. In fact, probably that's the least thing it does, maybe besides facsimile. Mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, by the way, Xerox was one of the first to invent the facsimile. Fax machine. I mean, mm -hmm. my gosh, you know, just the innovators they are. Right. So, you know, Cindy, talk to us about how differently as a sales trainer do you think it was in 1981 to what we're selling you sent me to Leesburg, Virginia for two yeah. weeks. I had to learn spin, right. which was, do you remember the answer to that one? Or I need yeah. the answer. What is it? What, what, S? S? Situation. Situation. P. Problem. Problem. I. I. Implication. The end. Needs payoff. And it still exists. And so yes. how has it changed, do you think? Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm just going to kind of roll back even before 81 when Peter came on board. And, and it was 1979 when I came on board with Xerox. And, um, the guys before me told me it was an order-taking environment, meaning we didn't have to sell at all, <laughs> which sounded great to me. But by 1979, I think it was the hour I joined Xerox, um, the Japanese competitors came in because we lost our patent on the, uh, as Peter was saying, on the um, on the xerographic method. So all of a sudden, when the Japanese competitors came in, we had about six or seven players in the marketplace that would follow us in sales calls, and we had to differentiate ourselves not by our product anymore that was over we had to differentiate ourselves by the way we sold and we were strong believers in paying attention to what customers needed and then selling them what they needed and using techniques that were consultative rather than high pressure sales and i want to go back to david kearns who was our leader at the time um, i really believe he invested in the whole organization on making sure that we knew how to outsell the competition. Because at the time, we couldn't say our products truly were better than the competition. The competition had studied xerography. We were kind of lax, to be honest with you. We, were, we had a monopolistic hold on the marketplace at that time. And when you go from a monopolistic hold to being shocked with how many entries can come into your marketplace, it takes a while to recover. So the recovery phase, I think, was about when Peter came into the marketplace. And, and we, yes, we used several different types of selling techniques, but they all focused on the buyer. And what we did was listen a lot and ask a lot of really good questions instead of trying to push a box down a customer's throat. And I think that's why we stayed in business, is that we, it, was, it was the sales mm -hmm. person that differentiated mm -hmm. themselves. And our customers wanted to do business with the person and the company, 
and they didn't necessarily attach themselves to the box, thank goodness, because if we had gone to a selling process that was my box is better than your box, we would have lost. So how does that compare to the way we sell today? We will be talking about some new methods of selling, and I think it, it gets into, and Peter and I have been talking about it earlier today, new methods of selling include branding and personal branding, branding of yourself as a salesperson um, through internet media, media like this. Um, there's a lot of different ways through LinkedIn and Facebook. There's a lot of ways to brand yourself to get people to know you um, without cold calling, which was the first phase of a sales call in our old days. And that, but the selling process itself hasn't changed once you get in front of a customer. It's still good salespeople listen a lot, ask a lot of questions. They don't focus on price. They focus on what a customer needs and wants and what problems a customer is trying to, to, to resolve. No, very well stated. And you know, one of the things I say twofold is uh, the, I think the word value is overused. And I don't think people, when they say it, know what the heck they're talking about. Mm. And I think if you talk to any, let's say, somewhat tenured seasoned sales rep, explain to me why you're so value, va value driven versus your competition. And where do they usually come up? Well, we have great products, we have great support. We have great prices, by the way. Our people are really nice. I mean, we bend over backwards to make you happy. Well, guess what? Everybody does that. I don't know of any organization. You know, products are average. You know, service, you know, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and prices, you know, we, we, we make a profit. You know, so, you know, I really want to just talk about what does it mean to be valued like Xerox plans to be now and in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of it has to do with the marketing part, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And value is not... It's not the product, it's what the product needs to somebody. And I think that's the, the, the differentiation, if I can bring the word value, mm -hmm. some meaning to the word value, and it really gets back to, is a salesperson successful in having a product mean something to somebody, and how much does it mean? Instead of just having the product out there, do you want to buy this cup or not? Well, the cup, if, you're not, if it's full of water and you're not thirsty, it's not valuable. But if you're dying of thirst, and it's full of water and you have a big need, it's very, very valuable. Well, I have a little bit of water in mine. <laughs> so, you know, I'm really glad we brought up the Paul Orfala story because yes. do you think, and I think you know the answer is a rhetorical, do you think, Paul, that you're using the, the, the power of Xerox to become successful? Huh? Mm -hmm. Don't you think just a little? Call me, Paul, Natalie, or whatever you want. But do you think there was some value at that time for doing business with Xerox, maybe say IBM or somebody else. Absolutely, the branding itself alone, with having a Xerox name on every Kinko's establishment, there was no question whether he was gonna be delivering something of, of value to his customers. That's very much so. And you know, Cindy, I gotta say, that still exists with Xerox right now. Mm -hmm. When you do business with Xerox, it's just not you're buying a piece of equipment. You're actually bringing in a Fortune 500 company that's an American icon that still is a strong force, values diversity, and it's true value because guess what? We're going to market you just because we exist in the building. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad that was unrehearsed, believe it or not, thinking about Paul and how he abused, I mean, I used <laughs> the ability of Xerox. So if you're a small to medium sized company in any community, I'm just talking about the tri counties, but there's value, I think, in that, that nobody else in this industry could match. Would mm -hmm. you agree? I, I agree wholeheartedly. I haven't hadn't worked with Xerox for many, many years until just recently. Um, I will say the val there's part of the I'm gonna bring the people back there again. There's value in the people that you work with at Xerox. Um, I still was amazed at the type of person that was employed by Xerox, the integrity, the quality. I was just with a group of about a hundred last week. I haven't been in front of a group like that in a long, long time since I left Xerox. Mm. And in my mind, I told you at lunch, you never left, so I, never left. I, she just updated me on yeah. things like that. But I think that's something, do you think customers are different now than they were in 1981? Um, <laughs> what, what factor do you think actually changed that? Well, the internet Ugh. has been the biggest, it has made the biggest impact on buying um, from a customer standpoint, because there's a lot of information that's out out there now and accessible, customers can do a tremendous amount of homework prior to a sales call being made. And a customer can be more informed about the product or the industry that they're buying within than perhaps a salesperson. 
So it puts a lot of onus on the salesperson to know a lot about their customer because the customer knows a lot about the salesperson's company, about the salesperson's product offerings, and we believe that since if the customers can know that much, the salesperson better use the internet to research the companies they're doing business with, the products that the customers are trying to sell, and some of the business problems the customers are dealing with, whether it's industry problems, whether it's legislative problems, um, or any type of issue. They better know the customer as well as the customer knows themselves to differentiate, to differentiate themselves from the competition. You know, to build on what you're saying, literally a buyer could call me up as somebody in marketing and sales and say, I want this product, I want this configuration. I noticed that in Arkansas, Arizona, that this is the price right. that they're, they're asking for. And then you look at the sheet as a person in this industry and say, well, that's below my cost. Mm -hmm. So customers are not only informed about features, capabilities that we used to educate them on, right. but now they know the pricing. And we live in kind of an oxymoron society, meaning that we all might need to make a profit, right, mm -hmm, to right. exist, but customers don't want to pay <laughs> a profit. <laughs> so there's got to be something else that a vendor, a manufacturer has to give besides your typical, I was going to put you on the spot, the two-sided copying, the mm -hmm. straight paper path, the reliability, the copy quality, that is all given. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to use the marketing power and be able to basically, it's not sales anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about cold calling. I mean, what do you feel about cold calling? Yeah, when, in, when we started with Xerox, cold calling was knocking door to door. So in an establishment like where we're sitting today, there might be five copier people coming and knocking on the door and asking to see the decision maker in order to sell a copy machine. And they would spend all day, just like I did, just like Peter did. I had Glendale, California. I'll never forget, it was 110 degrees. I'm in my business suit looking like a man. Um, walking door to door in my high heels trying to sell Xerox equipment. Today, cold calling has taken on a whole different um, meaning. It can be done in the comfort of your air-conditioned home using LinkedIn and Facebook to find out who the decision makers are. And there's a numerous jigsaw, Hoover's, there's numerous other um, sources of information where you can cold call and actually spend time on your computer rather than walking the streets like we both did when we no. first started at Xerox. Well, hearing cold calls has made me kind of a little ill and nauseated, so we need to take a break. Uh -huh. Come on back. <laughs> Hi, this is Peter Godinas from KDTV.com. I'm here to announce a new show that we're all excited about here called Meet the Boss. Now this is about all your friends and neighbors who own businesses and being able to support them in their causes and helping them stay healthy. So save this program in your favorites, make sure you spread it out to your friends, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all here in Ventura County. All right, we're just kind of wrapping up here. This has been real fun. We apologize if we kind of ramble, but we're obviously we're excited about a lot of things, about what's in the future, uh, what this world is going to be all about. I'll be ready to change, but the Xerox Technology Hour is definitely celebrates Xerox in the Tri-Counties. And my job, as well as Cindy's from a distance from Orange County, is to be able to know that Xerox is an integral part of this community in helping, developing, and promoting businesses, small and medium size, in our community. So that's the purpose, and uh, we hope that that's what you took it as. So we talked a lot about just the people, you know, the process and how things are changing. Mm -hmm. You know, social media is definitely in the new uh, marketing in our society. You know, I know I've been in it, you're starting to learn, and you're learning like, I touch everything in like five minutes, <laughs> and it all got downloaded to your brain. <laughs> Do you think really that is the way to go? I do. Um, I'm a small, I run a small business myself, and I was challenged by even words that I've used continually throughout this program, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter. Um, there's a lot of social media wa ways to reach people through social media. And I was baffled by which way to, how to, how to use these mechanisms. and. I think one thing that Peter brings to the Tri-Counties and what he's trying to do through, or, through venues like this is to help small business not just become more productive because they purchase a Xerox machine, but become better at selling what they sell. 
which is teaching them how to use social media to brand themselves and to get known out in the community. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of people, especially in corporations, who think, I wonder when this is going to go away so we can get back to some serious cold calling and telephonics. So my bet is that it is going to be the thing to do. And I think it's actually going to change the way people buy. You know, Peter, I have attended a lot of social media uh, meetings within the last two months since you've turned me on to this whole thing and told me about it. I've gone to, and I'm sure they have.